Aboard, shipmates! I'm Jerry Bryant, and I'll be your Captain Professor on this voyage across the Shanty Sea. This is episode two of Shanty Talk, where I take a traditional sailor shanty, which was a work song, and I explain the history of it, the context, its origins, and how sailors used them on board 19th century square riggers. If you missed episode one, you can find that by subscribing to this channel at the end of the video. There'll be a little button you can press. That'll also let you know when I add new episodes. Oh, by the way, uh, episode one was all about an, an old uh, capstan shanty called Spanish Ladies. But in this episode, we're going to look at a shanty called Santiano. It was spelled various ways. You, if you're going to look it up online or in a, a, a printed collection, you might find it spelled all these different ways. Um, we don't know why, I guess, uh, because it's a foreign word for English speakers, perhaps. <laughs> the song dates to the early 1850s, and there is a common variant of it that appears in many collections called the Plains of Mexico, but I'm going to leave that to the side today, and we're going to focus just on Santiano. What I'm going to do is dig into the history of it. I'm going to describe what type of work the sailors sang it to. Then I'll tell you a little about who Santiana was and General Taylor. These are the main characters that appear in the song. And finally, I'll introduce you to some of the great shanty collections where you can find this shanty and many other great songs. Well, I noticed that the tide is on the ebb, so let's set sail and get underway. Every true shanty was associated with a specific job on board a ship. There were two main categories of shanties. There were hauling shanties and heaving shanties. Hauling shanties were used when the men were pulling on a rope, and heaving shanties were used when they were pushing on something. Santiano was a heaving shanty, and it was used mainly for work on these three kinds of machines that you'd find on a square rigger. There were the pumps, the windlass, and the capstan. Now, a question you may have is, how do we know how, what job a shanty was used for? Well, the reason is that the collectors who started writing down shanties, getting them from old sailors back before they all completely died and shanty would totally disappear, the sailors told them, oh, this was, uh, this was a capstan shanty or an anchor shanty or a windlass shanty or whatever. And there's a, there's a lot more about the collectors uh, a little later in the video because it's to them that we owe the fact we can even sing shanties today. Another question you might ask is, well, why would sailors want to sing when doing this work? And there's two answers really for that. Number one is because of the rhythm. All of these jobs required a, a steady rhythm. And I'll, I'll be showing you some details so you understand that. Uh, but a song would help keep the rhythm and make the work more efficient so they didn't get as tired as quickly. But secondly, uh, most heaving jobs were kind of long ones and singing just helped the time pass. It helped the crew uh, get the job done without feeling really wiped out. Um, so th those are the two main reasons. Now there also is a really basic question which I want to answer which is what exactly were they pushing or pulling when they were singing these songs. <laughs> now, as I mentioned a minute ago, there were these three types of machines that sailors sang heaving shanties when they were using. And the first one is the pumps. Now, this was the most common heaving job on board square riggers. They called it pumping ship. Um, it was pumping out the bilges. And because wooden ships, all of them leaked to some extent, uh, pumping was a daily job, and uh, they regularly had to use these big hand-operated pumps to get rid of all the extra water. Now, depending on how leaky a ship was, this might take hours a day, and it was also an absolutely crucial job, uh, a matter of survival, in fact. Uh, there's a line from the well-known pumping shanty called Leave Her Johnny, and it goes, uh, it was pump or drown, the old man said. And that was literally true, because if you didn't get rid of the extra water, the ship would fill up with it and sink. So even though it was a hard job, it was one that the sailors knew they needed to do. 
There were two kinds of pumps used on square riggers uh, in, in, back in the day. This first one, uh, which you're seeing here, is called the Jiggity Jig Pump, and it's kind of like a teeter-tottery motion. Um, so the men were heaving the handles up and down uh, on either side of the, of the pump barrel itself. And then came the Downton Pump, which was a, a vast improvement. And here's an image of that. It was a rotary pump that uh, improved efficiency uh, and made the work actually a little easier. Um, now, the, the Downton pump was invented in 1825, so um, we know that songs that uh, relate to the Downton pump came after that day. And what I mean is, so sailors were very careful about their language. And they would, they would only use the word heave if they were actually doing that kind of pushing job. Um, but there are certain kinds of shanties that have both heaving and hauling in the same chorus. One great example is the, the shanty South Australia, which, in which the chorus runs heave away, haul away. And so that really is kind of a strange thing when, when you start to understand how shanties and sailors work. Well, the reason was that the Downton pump allowed sailors to use both of those types of motions. So you'll notice here there are, there are handles on the rotary, the flywheels they call them. And so there were men who would grasp the handles and they would heave on the handles to, to rotate the pump. But to make it even more efficient and get more men on the job, they would attach ropes to the ends of the handles. They called them bell ropes. And that would allow men to, to then pull on the rope to heave on the line as the pump handles went around, which made it uh, easier for everybody involved. And so that's why you have this seeming contradiction in some shanties where they were heaving and hauling at the same time. Oh, by the way, these drawings that I'm sharing, they're all by uh, a Stan Hugel, who was not only an actual shanty man on ships, uh, but he was a collector and an author and an artist, as you can see. And because he was there, he served on, on square rig sailing ships, his drawings are very accurate and we can trust that what we're seeing in them is the way things looked back then. So our second machine that you'd sing a heaving song to is the windlass. And here's a picture of one. Uh, this is a kind of a winch and the axle is horizontal, um, kind of uh, parallel to the deck. It was used to raise the anchor, it was used to move heavy spars around on the ship to, to bring the ship closer to the dock, uh, things like that. Um, this was another uh, teeter-tottery motion. Uh, there are wooden handles called brakes, and uh, that's a little contradictory actually when you think about it because the men would say we got to heave on the brakes um, when in fact heaving on the brakes was what made the windlass go. Sailors are full of contradictions like that. And then the third machine, probably the best known, is the capstan. If you want to sound like an old salt, you should drop the T and pronounce it capstan. That's apparently what all the old sailors did. It was another kind of winch, but in this case the axle was vertical. And so unlike uh, the pumps and the windlass, this job required the men to march around in a circle heaving on what were called the capstan bars or the hand spikes. Now, while the, the windlass was common up until the, the mid-1800s, it, it gradually got replaced by the capstan, which was more efficient and didn't take up as much room. As, as iron and steel started to replace wood as the main um, material used to construct sailing ships, um, the vessels got bigger and so did the yards and the sails. And so that led to a really interesting um, conundrum for shanty folk, shanty nerds like me, because in the late 19th century, you would have a situation where the men needed to raise the, the topsail yard, for example, the, the, upper, the main upper topsail, which was a big, heavy sail with a heavy yard, and the yard was the, 
the cross stick that the sails were attached to. Uh, and but because they were so big and crews were smaller, they would actually sometimes use the capstan to raise the sail. And so the conundrum is that here you've got sailors doing what is essentially a hauling job, which is raising sail, using a, uh, a capstan or a heaving shanty to do that. Welcome to the world of shanty weirdness. Now, because these jobs were long ones, the shanties were long too. Uh, heaving shanties all often had a storyline and something called a grand chorus, which was, um, you know, a, a chorus that everyone would sing together. The 19th century sailors adopted lots of different songs for use as heaving songs, uh, particularly popular after the right after the Civil War were the the favorite marches and, and and patriotic songs that came out of the Civil War songs like Battle Hymn of the Republic and John Brown's Body and Dixie uh, there there's lots of evidence that sailors use those around the capstan and, and at pumps as well there were heaving songs that that tended to be very musical that that was pretty common for these kinds of songs more musical in some ways than hauling shanties but it's the reason I think that we tend to like heaving shanties more today. You, a lot of the popular shanties that are being sung today and, and shared are the, the, the caps and shanties, the pump shanties, which have a storyline, which have a great chorus. And um, we find that more musical and more interesting in some ways. Okay, now that we've got a sense of how Santiano was used, let's take a look at what all the words are talking about. Now first, I have to decide which version of Santiano I'm going to share with you today. All shanties have multiple versions. There were three main versions of Santiano. There's the story of Santiano during the Mexican-American War. Then there's one uh, that extols the, the virtues of the lovely Mexican senoritas, but it has nothing about the war in it. And then the third version that you find most commonly is uh, it's a bit about a benevolent sailor who fantasizes about filling up a ship with booze and then giving it away to all his friends uh, and they have a big drinking party. But because I'm a Yank and I'm a history fan, I'm going to go with the story of the historical version of Santa Ana, who was both the president of Mexico and the head general of the Mexican army during that war. The war ended in 1848, by the way. But I'm going to use the preferred Yankee version of, the, uh, of that variant. Uh, it's the one in which the Americans actually win the war, because that's really what happened. Um, as opposed to the preferred British version, in which Santi wins the battle and the Americans run away. Um, we don't really know why limey sailors made up a version that was so contrary to the facts. Uh, there is evidence that British sailors uh, fought on the side of Mexico during the war. So maybe they were loyal. We don't know. Uh, according to the old sailors that this shanty was collected from, it, w it wasn't uncommon for limey and Yankee sailors to, to come to blows over these different versions. Uh, shanty fights. Um, it'd be something to behold. Oh, a little trivia for you. The, the term limey to describe a British person, that, that was coined by American sailors who were mocking the British for having to drink a dose of lime juice every day as a way to prevent scurvy. Now, I assume that means that the Americans suffer from scurvy a lot longer than the British. Oh, well. My version, the one I'm going to share with you today, was collected... Uh, by John and Alan Lomax in 1935 from an old sailor man named John M. Hunt, whose nickname was Sailor Dad, and he lived in Virginia at that time. Like all shantymen do, I've adjusted the, the lyrics of that version, uh, played around with the tune a little bit to suit my own fancy. That's just how it worked. So here's the First two verses in the choruses. We're sailing down the river from Liverpool. Heave away, Santiano. 
around Cape Horn to Frisco Bay, along the plains of Mexico. So heave her up and away we'll go, heave away, Sadiano. Heave her up and away we'll go, all on the plains of Mexico. We've a fast, clever ship with a bully good crew. Heave away, Santiano. And a down east Yankee for captain to all on the plains of Mexico. So heave her up and away we'll go. Heave away, Santiano. Heave her up. And away we'll go, all on the plains of Mexico. Well, we are on our way from England, that's where Liverpool is, to California. And you can see on the map that we are sailing all the way around the southern tip of South America to get from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. Cape Horn is at the very bottom of the South American continent, way down there next to Antarctica. This trip was approximately 16,000 miles. A bit of a haul. <laughs> now, here's a, here's a great piece of sailing ship trivia for you. The fastest passage made from New York to San Francisco in, in that time period was in 1854 by the uh, extreme clipper called the Flying Cloud. She made that trip in 89 days. The average time for that trip from the east coast of America to San Francisco was 200 days. So this tells us that the captain of the Flying Cloud was really cracking on. And cracking on is, means carrying all possible sail as much of the time as they could. There are, there are clues to the age of the shanty uh, here in these first two verses. First, we're on a clipper ship. And clipper ships were a specific kind of square rigger that were very common and popular in the Merchant Marine in the 1850s. So that's a good clue as to the age. Also, we're on our way to San Francisco. And as you may recall, uh, gold was discovered in San Francisco in, in 1848, and in 1849 the gold rush started. So that tells us we are headed during the gold rush period and most likely in the early 1850s. Now the shanty man would sing the first line and the third line of the verse, and uh, the crew would sing the refrains. And the refrains are the same, both in the verses and in the grand chorus. Heave away, Santiano and all on the plains of Mexico. The grand chorus is typical of a heaving shanty like this, particularly an anchor shanty, although most versions of this song don't include the grand chorus. It's, it's a little puzzling, actually. Um, but then every shanty man had his own way of doing things, and the ones the collectors met with they, for whatever reason, uh, just sang it straight without the grand chorus. Now, we, we can be certain this is a heaving shanty, even if the, the sailors, the, the collectors talked to, didn't tell us this, because it says so right in the first refrain. Heave away, Santiano. And sailors were very particular. They would not use the word heave if that's not what they were doing. So you can, you can be sure that if you come across a shanty with the word heave or the word haul, they're talking about a certain kind of job and they wouldn't have gotten it mixed up. We can also tell that this is an anchor uh, shanty used to, to haul up the anchor because it says that in the second refrain. Heave her up and away we'll go. And that really can only refer to getting the anchor off the bottom because until they did that, they couldn't go anywhere. Um, both the capstan and the windlass were used to bring up anchors. Now the second verse refers to the captain being a down east Yankee, and that means he was from the state of Maine, which is my home state, state pride here. 
There's another fascinating factoid about a little town in Maine called Searsport. And you can just see it on this map. That, this town, small, had an amazing impact on the American merchant marine in the 19th century. Um, statistics show that over the course of the 19th century, this one town, small town uh, on Penobscot Bay, supplied 300 sea captains for American commercial sailing vessels. Now this is 10% of the total number of captains sailing under American flags during the 19th century. Really uh, kind of an astonishing figure when you, when you start to think about it. All right, in the next verses, we're going to start to hear a little bit about Santiano and the war. Santiano was a good old man, heave away, Santiano, till he fouled the halls of Uncle Sam all on the plains of Mexico. General Scott and Taylor to heave away, Santiano. They made poor Sandy meet his Waterloo all on the plains of Mexico. When Zacharias Taylor gained the day, heave away, Santiano. He made poor Santi run away all on the plains of Mexico. Now, Santi's full name was, and I've got to read this, Antonio de Padua Maria Severino Lopez de Santa Ana y Perez de Lebron. That is almost a verse of a shanty right there. Um, there is a great sailor expression in that first uh, verse that is saying, he fouled the haws of Uncle Sam. And that's uh, sailor talk for getting into a fight. The haws was at the bow of the ship, and it's where the anchor chain of the cable came out. And um, uh, here's a couple of photos to give you a sense of how that looked. Literally to foul the haws of another ship meant to get tangled up in her anchor chains which was a real mess and a situation that always elicited uh, rather strong emotions, as you can imagine. Now, while the Mexicans technically fired the first shot in what we call the Mexican-American War, they were actually provoked by American troops uh, invading their territory at the orders of President James Polk. So, if you want to be really, really technical about this, it was the Americans who fouled the Hawes of uh, Santiana. Now the American generals who led the army during the two years of fighting, which were 1846 and 1847, uh, were Winfield Scott and Zachary, not Zacharias Taylor. There, there's all sorts of examples of sailors playing around with names, place names and proper names. Um, I guess because it was fun <laughs> and maybe because it scanned better in some of the songs. But uh, Zachary Taylor parlayed his, uh, his status as a war hero into uh, a successful bid for the presidency in 1848. He was, he was number 12. He shows up in, in several different shanties, not just this one. What we don't know is why would sailors have created a shanty about a Mexican general and politician who lost the war? We'll, we'll never really know the answer to that, I'm afraid. One thing you, you may want to refresh your memory on is the line, they made poor Santi meet his Waterloo. And that's a reference to uh, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, and the battle that ended his career. The reference to Santi running away, it's rather unkind because actually the Mexicans fought hard and bravely against the invading Americans. And uh, they still lost the war in the end, but they, they were not cowards. Okay, next up is we get into some shantyman fantasy. T'was on the field at Molly Del Rey, heave away, Santiano. Santiano lost a leg that day all on the plains of Mexico. 
Now Santiano shovels his gold heave away. Santiano around Cape Horn in the ice and cold all on the plains of Mexico. All right, fact check right there. Santiano did not lose a leg uh, at the battle or ever. Um, <laughs> he was uh, two-legged right up to the day he died. Um, there, is, uh, there is another version of this uh, with a verse that refers to him running away on a cork leg. So I guess this was uh, a popular fantasy uh, among sailors that he had, uh, he had become a, a, an amputee. Uh, Molly del Rey is sailor pronunciation for the Mexican city Molino del Rey, which is um, it's a city on the way to Mexico City, the capital at the, as the Americans were advancing um, towards the end of the war. Now, although the version in which Santiana wins and Mexico wins appears in many of the main shanty collections, uh, the Americans actually did win the war, and they gained uh, a mass of new territory as a result. All or part of the modern states of Texas, Arizona, New Mexico, California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Wyoming. Santiana himself went into exile after the war, um, and he lived into his 80s, as a matter of fact. Speaking of shanty collections, they are the reason that we can still sing shanties today. For most of the 19th century, scholars and nice people didn't pay any attention to these uncouth, rough, uh, uneducated sailors who sang these weird, uh, dirty songs on board ships. Um, the first true collection of shanties was published in 1888 in England by a woman named Laura Smith. It wasn't until sailing ships were actually disappearing from the world's ocean that folks started collecting the old shanties to preserve what was truly a dying art form at that time. There are several important collections of shanties that were published in the early 20th century, and two of the biggest ones, uh, Hugel and Dorflinger, were published in the 50s, the 1950s and 1960s, right at the beginning of the folk revival. Now, Santiano appears in just about every collection of shanties that is out there. It was obviously very popular with sailors, uh, but in only one case that I've been able to find was a grand chorus given. And that was in, uh, that was in Sailor Dad Hunt's version. Um, but I've noticed that almost every singer today that sings Santiano does the Sailor Hunt version with the Grand Chorus. And I, I wondered, why would that be? So I did some digging. And here's my theory. I think that the early revival singers accessed and used the Lomax collection to, to find songs to, to add to their repertoire as they were beginning to rediscover traditional folk songs. Both uh, the Weavers and the Kingston Trio recorded Santiano in the 1950s. And, and they were really, really popular hits <laughs> at that time. So uh, there was a whole generation of, of singers that grew up listening to that version of Santiano. And I think that's what's been passed on uh, to us today. And that's why we sing this particular version most of the time. Now, in case you are wondering uh, where to begin or how to begin your own shanty collection, and why wouldn't you want to do that? <laughs> uh, here's my recommendation for the best collections to start with. This, this will help you become a real shanty nerd. And there, there are four that I think are almost required. The first one is Shanties from the Seven Seas by Stan Hugel. Stan, who I had the pleasure of meeting and singing with uh, in the late 80s and early 90s, he was a, a shantyman on square riggers in the 19 teens and 20s. Um, so he collected his songs uh, right from the source. Then there's Songs of the Sailor and Lumberman by William Dorflinger. 
Uh, I also had a chance to meet Bill, and um, he was a scholar, uh, um, I think a musicologist and historian, um, who did amazing amount of collecting uh, of American shanties in particular. Then there's Roll and Go, Songs of the American Sailor Man by Joanna Colcord. And Joanna's father, Lincoln, was one of those Searsport sea captains I mentioned earlier. And she basically grew up on his sailing ships in the late 19th century uh, on his voyages to and from China, from the East Coast. And finally, you got to get your hands on Shantying Aboard American Ships by Frederick Harlow. Fred Harlow uh, left Boston in 1876 and sailed on the square rigger to Australia and back. And he was very interested in the shanties that were sung. He recorded, uh, wrote them down, of course, because he didn't have a tape player at that time. Uh, all of the shanties that were sung on that voyage, when they were used, who sang them, how they were sung, and so on. So it's, uh, you, you get a sense of the shanties as well as of what it was like to actually be on a ship singing them. Each of these collectors was a sailor, except Dorflanger, like I mentioned, so they knew a short drag from a windless shanty. But don't discount Dorflinger's collection because he didn't have any salt spray on his eyebrow. He did a lot of research, so there's some great historical uh, context and notes in his book as well. Well, I'm going to finish up with an evocative paragraph from Joanna Colcord's collection. This was published in 1924. And it was the first American collection. And she is describing Santiano being sung in New Bedford, Massachusetts as the, as the last of the square rig whaling ships came into port. The last whaler to return to New Bedford hauled into dock to the tune of this old shanty. And it was told me by one who was present that the grim old seafarers who gathered on the pierhead to watch shed tears unashamed as the well-remembered notes rang out across the harbor for the last time. Well, that's the story of Santiano. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you for tuning in. I am going to continue this series, so if you want to keep learning, go ahead and subscribe to my channel. The little round uh, button with the drawing of the concertina player, I call him Ranzo, uh, that's how you subscribe. Uh, if, you have, if you have any questions or comments, please do uh, put them in the comment section. Uh, I love feedback. If you've already uh, organized your sock drawer and cleaned out your email inbox and you still have time to kill, why don't you check out my website, jerrybryantsings.com, to listen to a full version of Santiano that's similar to the one I presented here today. Uh, here's a link to, a, to one by The Longest Johns, which is a darn good one. May you have fair winds and following seas.